I can't think of a better way to encourage kids who are independent readers, who are creative tweens, who want to impact the world. I can't think of a better way of doing it than to give them Jewish books. This is the Book of Life. I'm Heidi Rabinowitz. PJ Our Way is a program that offers free Jewish books to middle grade readers. It's an outgrowth of the well-known PJ Library program, which does the same thing with picture books for younger readers. To learn more about why and how PJ Our Way works, I spoke to Catriella Friedman, director of PJ Our Way, by phone at her home in Israel. Catriella, you are the director of PJ Way, which grew out of the program PJ Library. Can you explain what is PJ Library and what is PJ Way, and what is the difference between them? So PJ Library is really the dream and the vision of Harold Grinspoon, who founded PJ Library close to 10 years ago. Children and families from all over the country can sign up for PJ Library starting from six months until they turn eight. And every month they get in the mail a beautiful, high quality Jewish picture book. At the same time, they're able to engage and interact with our PJ partners and communities who develop amazing engagement programs that these families can then participate in. PJ Arway was an extension of Harold's vision. We heard from so many families with children who were getting older who said, why would you stop at age eight? So it was really Harold's vision to say, let's expand PJ Library through age 11. And he understood from the very beginning that you can't send a book to an independent reader. These are tweens. These are kids who really need to be engaged and they need to be active. So we created a program where they can choose their own books. So unlike PJ Library, where the books come automatically each month, with PJ Our Way, kids choose their books each month. And they can go to a website where they can see all sorts of amazing information that's kid developed around each book. They can read kid reviews. They can read kid written blog posts, kid video trailers, all produced by kids to engage them in each of the books that we offer to help them make their decisions. Okay, great. Now, to me, it's kind of instinctive why it's important to provide Jewish families with Jewish reading material. But can you explain it? Because it might not be obvious to everyone who's listening. Today's families who are raising Jewish children do not feel the same kind of connection to these large institutions, the synagogues, the JCCs, the characterized American Jewish community from the turn of the 20th century and from waves of immigration. Many of them are coming to Judaism later in life. Some of them are interfaith couples. So the idea of leaving the home and entering one of these institutions where they may not feel a part of what's going on. It's a scary idea. So the beauty of PJ Library and the PJ Our Way is that it really becomes almost like a DIY form of Judaism, where families can feel like they're being engaged with Judaism. They can bring Jewish ideas, Jewish conversations, Jewish rituals back into the home. So really, it's the tool for families to build their Jewish identity within the home. And for our partners who are more or less coming from these larger organizations to now be able to reach out to these families and become a conduit for them to experience Judaism also within the community. With PJ Arway, the children not only have a choice of what they want to read, but they're very involved in the back end. So can you explain how the children actually help to run the program to some degree? Absolutely, Heidi. This is the best aspect of the program. And when we talk about the ethos of PJ Arway, we really sum it up by saying putting kids in the driver's seat. This was really an outgrowth of conversations with different organizations that had tried to engage tweens. And what they learned from their failures became a benefit to us because they were able to show us what didn't work for them. And one of the main things that came out of it was you can't build an interactive program 
for kids without kids. So first of all, we have this amazing design team. This is a team of 10 kids, and they preview books that we're going to be offering in the PJ Way program. They write reviews for the books. They create video trailers, blog posts, and the blog posts aren't always about the books. It can be about Jewish holidays. They can be about Jewish summer camp. If you go to the website, you'll see that 90% of the content that we have on the website is actually kid-generated and mostly generated by this design team. So that when kids come back to the website every month to choose their books, they see what other kids think about the books. And so that naturally is a way for them to respond. Every month we get hundreds of reviews that kids from all over the country write about the books, comments that they post on the blog, and photos of their activities. So it really becomes a a kind of a hive of kid activity, all within a safe environment. Another aspect of our program is like PJ Library, we have a book selection committee of adults, but we don't accept books into our program unless we have vetted them with kid book reviewers. So we have an advisory committee of kids from all over the country, and we take their reviews very seriously. That's very exciting for the kids to have so much hands-on involvement. Can you tell me about any idea or creation by the PJ Arway kids that was particularly interesting or creative or surprising in some way? Oh, that's a really good question. So we have someone who was on the design team last year in the 2015-2016 year who loves Jewish summer camp. So she created a challenge on the website for kids to respond with their favorite Jewish summer camp that they went to, along with a haiku about their favorite food. And this got so many responses. We had like 60 responses from kids who were writing haikus about their favorite foods. So that was really surprising and also really fun. On a more serious level, we just expanded. We now have more than 20,000 kids in the program, which is very exciting. So we could start actually accepting manuscripts. Up until then, we only had accepted published books. So we got a wonderful manuscript called The Six Day Hero by Tamar Stein. It was the first time we were dealing with a manuscript, and it was the first time that we were dealing with a book about war. It's about the Six-Day War, and we weren't sure how kids were going to respond to it. So we stayed with our mantra, put kids in the driver's seat, and we pulled together a committee of six kids from around the country. There were a couple of kids who came from interfaith backgrounds. There were kids who were from homes that were Jewish, but they were not extremely affiliated outside of their home. And then one child came from an Orthodox day school. So that was the other end of the spectrum. And then in the middle, you had kids, some of whom had been to Jewish summer camp, some of whom had been to Hebrew school. So of different ages and half boys and half girls. And they took their jobs extremely seriously. They each read through the manuscript very carefully and came up with very, very constructive comments, which we then shared with the author, and the author was able to respond to the kids. And she actually made serious changes to some plot aspects of the book, and it's been selected as a Junior Library Guild selection. So we feel really excited about that. What are some of the most popular books in the PJ Arway program? Definitely Death by Toilet Paper. (laughs) What a great title. Yeah. We've offered that book twice, and both times we were completely blown over by the popularity and selection. We also have been surprised by how many boys have participated in the program. We expected the girl-boy ratio to be very much weighed towards girls. But the truth is the kids basically break down to 55% girls and 45% boys. We can have months where it's even close to 50-50 and some months where the boys overtake the girls. So that's been a very positive aspect of the program. Biographies are really, really popular. We have a series that we've started to translate from Hebrew. It's a very popular series in Israel called Minherat Hazman in Hebrew, which is the time tunnel. It's two kids from Jerusalem today who have a secret tunnel and it will take them back into different times of Israeli history. So we've translated two of those books, one taking place during Israel's independence war and another takes place during the Dreyfus Affair. Both of them have been really, really popular because they're very suspenseful and very adventurous. In addition, graphic novels do really, really well. 
So all of Barry Deutsch's books, the Harrowville series, Steve Shankin's series, Rabbi Harvey has done very well. And if you put toilet into the title, it's going to do well. <laughs> of course. Kids can be a little bit stereotypical in terms of how they choose books. We know beforehand what books boys will generally choose and what books girls will generally choose, which is interesting. Of course, the real way to try to disrupt those stereotypes would be within the families. But do you think there's anything that the PJ Arway program can do to try to get kids to read across those divides that they've created for themselves? I think the best way to encourage more broad reading is with what we're doing now, which is to offer books of all types of different levels, books that are more literary, books that are more humorous, books that are graphic novels, and just to try to get content out there that will help these kids be a part of the Jewish conversation and also part of the general world conversation at the same time. If authors are looking to break that stereotype, the best way to do it is to have two protagonists in your books, one a girl and one a boy. We also are looking for diverse backgrounds. We have two books that are coming out this year. In both books, the protagonist is an Asian American slash Jewish child growing up in America. We are also looking at a book where a Jewish child who's a survivor of World War II who escapes from France to America for friends, an African-American girl in the 1950s. And so any way that we can introduce diversity into the books is what we're looking for. And it's one of our true objectives in the program. So you're talking about manuscripts and books that are forthcoming, yet PJ Arway is not a publisher. So how does that work? First of all, how do you find new books, both published and unpublished material? And if it's unpublished, how do you help it become published? A lot of the books that we look at are recommended to us by publishers, by agents, by editors, and by authors themselves. Also from our professionals around the country. Today, in fact, a professional from Arizona pointed me to a book that was published in the 1970s that was part of a travel adventure series where it turns out one of the adventures takes place in 1492 in Spain during the Inquisition. I'd never heard of this book before. Other than that, we really go to the typical sources, Publishers Weekly, the Sydney Taylor Book Awards, Association of Jewish Libraries, uh, Tablet Magazine has really good end of year reviews on Jewish books, the Book of Life podcast, the whole Megillah, places like that. We're always mining for ideas. In terms of bringing a book to life or bringing an out of print book back to life, there are certain publishers that we work with. If there is an author listening to this show who would like to send you a manuscript, how would they do that? So I hope that there are authors listening to this show because here's my big pitch. Send me your books. <laughs> Submission guidelines are listed on the PJR Way website. Even without reading those guidelines, though, they can always send their books and their manuscripts and their recommendations to submissions at pjrway.org. And we're actually very excited because we decided to extend the $2,000 incentive award for accepted manuscripts to PJ Arway. So we are offering $2,000 to authors who send us a new manuscript that we haven't received before. And if we accept the manuscript, we will give them $2,000 in addition to any kind of monies that they will make from a publisher that agrees to bring the book into PJ Arway. So I hope that that encourages aspiring authors and also experienced authors to send us their manuscripts. And what is the end date for that program? December 2018. And at that point, we'll revisit and see what kind of manuscripts we receive during the year and make a decision about whether to continue. Okay, great. And on the other end of the spectrum, how can listeners sign their kids up for the program? It's really easy. Just go to www.pjrway.org. They'll see a button that says new sign up. And we like the fact that it says new because it sounds like Yiddish new. You can just click it and go through the enrollment process. And it takes just a couple of days for the enrollments to be approved. 
kids come back every month between the 1st and 10th of the month to choose their books. They'll get reminders by email to let them know it's time to choose their books each month. So PJ Arway is available to families at home, but I understand it's also available at sleepaway camp. Can you explain that? Absolutely. So this is another vision of Harold Greenspoon's. I have to give him credit because this is entirely his idea. As you might know, the Harold Greenspoon Foundation also supports Jewish summer camps through an arm of the Harold Greenspoon Foundation called J Camp 180. And Harold said, listen, what is your major population at camp? It's kids who are exactly in the PJR way age range. So two summers ago, we piloted a program where we let summer camps, the directors and staff, choose books from PJR way that would fit into their summer programming. And we provide for anybody who's PJR way age plus their bunk mates, we provide them with books with programming materials for the counselors, with reading flashlights, with bookmarks, and with information about the program during the summer. This summer, we accepted 65 camps all over the country, sleepaway camps, day camps as well. And they're already in the process of choosing their books for the summer. Some of them are going to be books that aren't even in the PJR Way program. They're specifically chosen for camp. So it's a great way to combat the summer slump So this is a way for counselors to be able to encourage reading during the summer. And with counselors, you really can continue that Jewish conversation with the books. Now, let's talk about Tikkun Olam, Repairing the World. How does PJ Arway help heal the world? Well, certainly, if we really, truly believe that Judaism and Jewish ideas and Jewish thought have worth in terms of how they help Jews and non-Jews understand ways that we can change the world, that we can litakem et ha'olam, to really repair the world, then I can't think of a better way to encourage kids who are independent readers, who are creative tweens, who want to impact the world. I can't think of a better way of doing it than to give them Jewish books. Why do I feel so strongly about that? I really feel like books level the playing field. The beauty of a book is that it doesn't matter what your background is. A book helps you learn the language to become part of the conversation. It helps you understand the ideas, the dilemmas, the history, the whole spectrum of Jewish thought through a character, through a story that engages you and has an impact on you. And so I really feel like a program like PJ Our Way is basically taking kids who are now independent and they're not teenagers yet. They still care about what we think. So this is a beautiful time to give them the tools to be able to be part of the Jewish conversation. Is there anything that you would like to talk about that I haven't asked you? I would like to talk about one thing, the Holocaust. And, and maybe I turn the question back to you, Heidi. We get a lot of Holocaust submissions, and PJ Library, because it's a program for little kids, PJ Library does not include Holocaust literature in their lineup. We made a decision with PJ Our Way that since these kids are older and since they're independent readers, we can introduce more complex subjects like the Holocaust. But at the same time, we feel like we get way too much in terms of Holocaust. And we've made a decision as a committee that we will not include in the PJR way lineup anything that's what I call Holocaust real time. Anything that takes place in the camps or the ghettos, we won't include. What we tend to include are books that are more about survivors or books with hope, books of escape or books that take place first, second generation after. Like we've included more Gleitzman's Now, which is about the grandfather who's a Holocaust survivor and his relationship with his granddaughter. And that's about as Holocaust as we'll get. But it's always been very interesting to me that it seems to be a topic that publishers and authors seem to gravitate towards. I was wondering what you thought about that. That's a really good question. 
If you've listened to the past Book of Life episode, where we had a sort of virtual panel discussion about the overabundance of Holocaust books for youth, the agreement on that panel was that a lot of these books are excellent in and of themselves as literature and as testimony. Um, I think that authors and publishers gravitate to this material because it's really dramatic. In some cases, it's exciting and suspenseful. There are stories of good and evil. So it's very compelling material. And because of the sentiment of never forget, there's always room for another exploration of those themes. But because those themes tend to be so attractive, it accidentally ends up making a lopsided selection. We definitely need to have more variety, find other ways to introduce kids to themes of good and evil and fighting for what's right and retaining your heritage. I think that you've made the right decision in terms of what's age appropriate, and I, I hope that you will sort of stand firm in your selection policy to not overdo it with the Holocaust books. While it's an important part of Jewish history, when there are young kids building their Jewish identity, you really do want to give them more positive than negative. Yes, it's important for them to understand that Jews have been persecuted and are still being persecuted, but if that's all they know of their heritage, that's going to drive them away more than pull them close. Absolutely. We have a persecuted past. It didn't start with the Holocaust. It's just that the Holocaust is the most dramatic expression of that. I like to joke that when it comes to parents, they understand that we sometimes will have books with burning at the stake, but God forbid there should be any kissing. <laughs> <laughs> if PJ ever creates a program for teenagers, I think that would be the right place for some of these more serious Holocaust books that take place in the camps or in the ghettos, and also for the kissing books. I think that in the teenage years, there's a need to explore right and wrong, and there's an interest in the dark side of humanity. Just a personal story, when I was a teenager, I was able to read things that I'm too squeamish to read now. For instance, I adored Lord of the Flies when I was a teenager, but I don't think I could read it now. I think there's just a phase you go through where you want to hear about the worst possibilities. Absolutely. And teens today are so engrossed with dystopian literature. Exactly. So if and when, because knowing Harold, it's only a matter of time before we expand to teens. Don't quote me on that. But we actually have quite a lineup ready for teens if we get to that. Okay, great, because they are excellent books. Absolutely. Catriella Friedman, thanks so much for speaking with me. Thank you, Heidi. This has really been a pleasure, and I appreciate you inviting me. This is Tamar Stein, author of The Six-Day Hero. I'll be joining you soon on the Book of Life podcast. I'd like to dedicate my episode to the kids who read The Six-Day Hero when it was just a manuscript, especially my son Tovar, who gave me great advice and made it a better book. If you enjoy the Book of Life podcast, please become a patron at patreon.com slash bookoflife. If you do, you'll get an autographed copy of Serendipity's Footsteps by Suzanne Nelson while supplies last. You can also help us out by leaving a review on iTunes or a comment on our blog at bookoflifepodcast.com. You can like our page at facebook.com slash bookoflifepodcast or follow us at twitter.com slash bookoflifepod. Email us at bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 561 206-2473. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida at cbiboca.org and is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilachmakers Klezmer String Band. Thanks for listening and happy reading. Happy reading.